we're studying obviously the book of Revelation, and it was the uh, the book that's called the, the 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 apocalypse. Sometimes it's the unveiling, it's the revealing of what's happening in the end times. Uh, that's one of the things that's uh, that's talked about. It's not the book of Revelations, plural. It's the revelation. It's the unveiling. It's the it's the actual uh, revealing of what God is doing in people's lives in the, in the end times. And so. One of the things that we're going to be covering uh, this week, uh, we are starting in the sixth chapter of Revelation. We covered chapter five a little bit, and we'll probably still delve into that somewhat because it's the, the, uh, the apocalypse, the, the seals are getting ready to be opened, uh, the four horses. Let's go to the next slide there, if you would. Uh, let's see here, what does that say? It says, I, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard it were a noise and a thunder, and one of the four living creatures saying, Come and see. And that's a, uh, obviously Revelation 6 1. And uh, it said, The word come is to proceed. Uh, now you've got to realize that these, these I tried to, uh, uh, these cherubim that were around the throne, that's guarding the throne is the ones that's actually speaking to John at this particular time. So what, what's going on is that John is hearing this come from these, these voices that's coming out that from these, uh, they're not really beasts, beasts is a negative term, but they're, they're creatures or they're creations of God that is just incredible. They're, they're awesome. I don't, I don't know how to describe it in a way that, uh, that we would be able to see it, but they, they're majestic. And so these creatures that are guarding the throne, that's the one that's saying, and as they spoke with these thundering voices, it says, come and see or come and proceed. And we're going to show you what's going on. Uh, let's go to the next slide there. If you, obviously, these are the four horses uh, with the uh, different colors of them. Let's see what the next one is there. And there, I'll leave that up for a while. That's actually the seven seals. It kind of gives you a timeline and in different ways of them being revealed. Uh, in that, and if you want a copy of that, we can get you a copy of it. Um, one of the things, though, that I really like is in Matthew chapter 24, and I'm going to read this to you, but we also have, uh, and don't bring up the slide yet, but we have a comparison of Matthew 24 to the, the unveiling of the apocalypse of what's going on in these seals. And it says, this is what's called the Olivet Discourse. It's Matthew 24, verses 3 through 8. And it says, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be and what will be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, take heed that no man deceive you. Uh, I want you to say that with me. Take heed heed that no man man deceive you. So I want you to understand that because in reality, Jesus is telling not only them, but us, there is going to be deception. There's going to be deception in the end times. There's going to be deception about what is going to take place. And and obviously, we know the deceiver is going to be released unto the earth and is going to be doing an incredible job to to really deceive a lot of people. Now, I I don't know about you, but... uh, this morning when I come in early to the church, uh, God kind of spoke something to me, and I never really thought about this before, but he said, uh, we need to win a billion souls for him. Have you, ever, have you ever prayed that prayer before? A billion souls conversions. That's what we need. You, you, wanna, you want something to focus on? That's what we need to be about our Father's business. Gives you an idea that we need to, our, our, our work is not done yet. We need to get a billion souls in. Amen? Amen. Is that doable? Amen. There's three people. See me after church? We're going to go out today. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, the, the, uh, that's one of the things I really think we need to focus on, too. You, we need to pray that God's will be done. If you remember last week, we talked about the fact that the prayers of the saints are presented before the throne of God. In Revelation, it, and it's before the throne, and those prayers as an offering to God is not only the incense that comes up to God in that way, but it, I believe it's also used for what's going to take place for the things that's going to go on on the earth. Amen? So your prayers, it, let, me, let me put it this way. Jesus said, I'm going away and I'm going to send you the comforter. And he says, therefore, you do the work that I'm supposed to do because I'm going away. Amen? So the, the responsibility is on us as the body of Christ to fulfill the kingdom of God 
on the earth. And that's what God wants us to do. And so that's why I think we says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. We're supposed to be doing the things God has chosen to work with us as individuals, as part of the body of Christ, to work with us to get the things done that need to be accomplished. He didn't have to, but that's the way he chose to do it. That's why I think prayer is so important for us to be able to pray for the things that we need to pray for, that God's will be accomplished in the earth. Uh, Look at it this way. Uh, We pray for people to get saved, and that actually opens the door for all of those things to start happening in those in those people's play in their lives. Amen. So nobody can get saved unless the Holy Spirit draws them. The Holy Spirit wants to everybody to be saved, but it, he's saying, I want you to start praying for that individual, which then you add as legal right, then those things are taking place on the earth. Amen. Amen. So that's what I want you to see. The responsibility is for us to have to be about our father's business. Otherwise, we just sit back and just wait. And that's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to be connected with him to do the things of the work of the ministry. Amen? So he says, Take ye that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see that you are not troubled. Because there's going to be riots all all over the nation. There's going to be tearing down things. You're going to see uh, police officers busting in and making sure people wear masks at Thanksgiving. I think that's in there somewhere. Um, For all these things must come to pass, for the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And it says all these are, they, they are not signs and the end is not yet. Uh, and it, it talks about in Matthew twenty four fifteen. it says, When therefore you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, let him understand them which are in Judea to flee to the mountains. Let's see the next, the next slide there. Um, what does this say here? And I saw and beheld a white horse, and he that sat upon it had a bow and a crown was given unto him that he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, I told you about how horses had actually was, uh, was a connection to come from one realm to the other. Uh, the spirit realm in that, it's been, uh, you can do research on that. Uh, they also, horses have always been connected to like a judgment that's happening in that sense or, or a battle or whatever else. But we know that the Antichrist, that he's going to be coming and he actually, must, some people think that this white horse means that Jesus is the one that's coming in the first part of the seal, and that's not true. This is the, what we would call the Antichrist or the, um, the Assyrian. The very first one was Nimrod, uh, who we would call the, uh, the Antichrist or the Assyrian or the one that's to come, and then the last one will actually be uh, as the Antichrist. Let's see the next line. There's some more horses there. Let's go, go to the next one. Now, here's, here's what I like here. For example, it says in Revelation 6, we see a white horse rider. We see a red horse war. We see the black horse famine, pale horse death, martyrs, and worldwide chaos. And in Matthew chapter 24, the one that I'm reading, there's going to be false Christs. There's going to be wars, famines, death, martyrs, and worldwide chaos. It's actually dovetails together with the seals that are taking, with what Jesus is saying here that's going to be in the last days. These are the things that's going to be happening on the earth during those times. Um, and obviously we know that the Antichrist uh, has a plan and he's going to be revealed uh, after the church is gone is what I believe. I believe that the church is going to be raptured and the Antichrist is going to be revealed at that time. However, he's not going to be revealed in all of his power. The way that he gets revealed is that he turns around and makes a covenant with for peace. And that's not the that's not really all of the things that's going to happen. But that's one of the ways that you can say that he's going to get into some power where he makes this covenant of peace uh, with Israel. And of course, we know the scriptures that says when they say peace and safety, the sudden destruction is going to happen. But that's one of the ways you're going to tell that this person, as he rise rises into power, is going to be a person that brings peace, that's going to be a temporary peace. But it's really, it's, it's that he's making a covenant. So 
uh, one of the things when we look at all of the different things, especially with, with what has been going on with our current uh, administration and how they were trying to get some of the nations around Israel and around Jerusalem uh, to be able to be at peace, make peace with Israel, you know, those are, are somewhat signs, but there's, there, we don't even have to have it in the news. There's a covenant that's going to be established that has to do with the Antichrist. And we always, as Americans, we tend to view prophecy through Americanized eyes. We always think the Antichrist is going to come from America, and that's not, that's not the case. He's, he, they call him the Assyrian for a reason. Uh, however, there are people also that I believe when it says that the Antichrist is coming, whether or not he's actually going to be human. Now, we know he's going to take a human form, but whether or not he is actually human uh, stands to be questionable. Uh, one of the things that we know that it says that he's going to he's going to do lies and signs and manifestations that happens, lying wonders, and I don't know about you, but there's there's uh, uh, people that I have seen uh, when I uh, on the internet whenever I do research about stuff that has to do with magic and different things, and you would not believe there there's legitimate people that do the deception like here look at this and they do something else and they kind of trick you. You know, that type of way. But I, then there's other people that's actually really doing real, real things. And those people are, are it's, it's the craziest thing because when you see them, their goal is to just kind of make people happy. They go out and do street magic and whatever else, and they, they just say, you know, I'm, this is really cool, making people happy. And it's real, it's deceptive in the point of what is coming to pass in that. And usually you'll see by the spirit behind that, usually when the, when the real stuff is showing up, they try to mimic Christ somehow. I've seen one person that actually had fed, uh, there was a village they was feeding, uh, he had fish coming out of, a, out of a bucket of water. I mean, the, he showed the bucket to everybody, and he's in Africa, and he's showing the bucket to everybody like this, and he's, and he's doing this. And then all at once, he starts pouring out, and he poured out over 150 fish onto the ground. Water and fish, this size of fish, not little, not guppies, this size of fish out of a five-gallon bucket, pours them out on the ground. That was not fake. This is not camera stuff. That's not fake. And then I seen the guy actually, later on, walked on water on the Thames River in, in England. Got, there's people, this event, I mean, there's no way they could have staged this in any way if, you're, if you think you're do, they're doing camera tricks or whatever else. The guy, it was on a, a bridge. They got people walking by on the bridge. They're all saying, hey, come here, look at this. And the guy's down below, starts walking on the water, and there's barges going by, and he's out there walking on the water. And finally, the, the, uh, the people, you know, the constables or whatever you want to call them in England, they come out on a boat and made him get in the boat and said, you can't do this. <laughs> You're not allowed to walk on water out here. You got to get in the boat, you know. But they're doing things. And then, and then the last one was, and this one could have been a trick, but the last one was uh, he wanted somebody down there at the, the cross down in South America where they got the big cross where they're like this. He said he wanted somebody. And there's, bit, you know, tourists and everything, and they're, they're out there. And he, he showed the, this girl, he said, I want you to do a selfie of me, you know, standing up by there. He goes up by there and then he starts levitating in front of the cross, you know, and stuff. So it's, there's going to be things that's going to happen in our time, let alone there could, there could be healings or whatever else or miracles or people that uh, could be raised from the dead or whatever else. You don't know. And for somebody to come along and then say, they can show you signs and wonders and then turn around and say that they're the Christ or they're whatever else. It will be easily to be deceived if that's what you're looking for. And that's, that's why I'm, I'm wanting to be careful about some of the things that we do see. Does that discredit the legitimate stuff? No, there's legitimate healings. There's legitimate things that happen. But I believe me, the Antichrist wants to come because his goal, obviously Satan's goal was to be like God. That was his goal. Uh, he, we, a lot of times we want to think that he wanted to take over God, but he knew he couldn't take over God. But his goal was, I want to be like God. I want to be worshipped like God. And so that's some of the things that we, when we see the Antichrist. And there's, there's much more. Uh, people think that uh, possibly he could be uh, an alien. 
what we would call an alien because uh, here in the last few years, there's uh, uh, even on Fox News and different ones and legitimate articles where they've come out with actual uh, Navy people and whatever, they're showing UFOs and they're showing that the government's been hiding it all these years and they're actually admitting now that they have uh, you know, metal that's not of this world and it could be from a different dimension, the other dimension that we're seeing things come through into our realm and that possible thing. And so what they would say, the big lie is going to be not only that it's just uh, uh, atheism or, or evolution as a lie, which has convinced most of the world of what's going on, but then if they turn around and they say, okay, now you have this person thing that manifests itself and then it says, you know what, we're from another wherever and we've seeded this planet and you guys are all part of our experiment type thing or whatever else. And, and if that's not good enough, the Catholic Church has actually agreed with this philosophy. They have said that we, you know, they believe that there's aliens out there and they believe that uh, they said if we, uh, uh, if they're aliens, they're, the question was, and they're writing books about it, theological books about it, saying, should we baptize them? Should we baptize aliens? And then they turned around and said, well, if that's really the case, if there's really aliens out there that's coming to visit us, maybe we need to be baptized of them because they're obviously farther along than we are. Um, so you can see the mindset that is getting ready to happen, uh, that they've been, they've been seeding the planet with this kind of philosophy for a long time in the airwaves and whatever else. And at some point, it would be real easy to explain where did, where did uh, all the Christians go? You know, that uh, whatever happened in the first place, whenever we get raptured. And then, you know, they, it'd be easy for the, that person to say, you know what? We're from another world. We took them home. You know, we're going to take you guys home at some point in time. Oh, okay. You know, whatever. You can see the deceptions that could take place with that kind of thinking that could happen. Amen? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to tell you because there's a lot of things... When you look at the multifaceted point, there is, however, no matter what the person shows up as, whether he shows up as an alien, you know, a lizard person, whatever it is, the shining one, whether he shows up as a manifestation of a man and he does all kinds of miracles, whatever it is, nevertheless, we know the Bible says that he is the deceiver, the Antichrist, the one that is going to be deceiving and taking over. And obviously the, the event that we know What's going to turn around in the seven-year period is whenever we see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. It says, in the holy place, uh, let them know uh, that's the time that you're supposed to go out into Judea and the mountains and whatever else. That abomination is the three-and-a-half-year mark for the tribulation period. Amen? So that's one of the things where he's actually going to turn on people. But when it, let's go back to the uh, previous slide, if you would. No, next one, previous one, go back, keep going there. Right there, when it, the first seal is released, sometimes there's, there's been teaching also that says that these seals from the one through uh, at least the first four seals have been released all at once at the same time. A lot of times we look at it as one seal being released, time happens, another seal being released, time happens, another seal being released. Some of them actually say that they believe that these, the first four, the four uh, horses, will be released all at one time and the things that's going to happen within that period. Uh, nevertheless, we do know that, th that the seals are going to be opened. There is going to be judgments that's going to be handed down because of that. And it says that he had a bow and a crown. And the, you know, For the Revelation 6-2, he says he had a bow and a crown. He went out conquering and to conquer. And that bow, the term we, we think of it as a military term as a bow you're thinking his bow and arrow he's riding a horse he's on he's doing a bow and arrow and he's conquering the bow in the actual uh when you look at the bible in the first the, the law of first mention whatever whenever a word has been mentioned first in the bible usually is consecutive throughout out the bible sorry i'm in the wrong spot uh consecutive throughout the bible what happens is that bow, we know that it was first mentioned with God, the judgment, the flood that happened. And God says, I'm making a covenant with the world and I'm putting my into the clouds, my, my bow into the clouds. Uh, that's going to show as a sign of the, my covenant with the, with the earth at that time. That bow in the translation for that means covenant. 
That's the thing that I'm trying to bring, bring across here. It says that there's the 6-2. It says he has a bow and a crown uh, and was a crown and he went out conquering to conquer. Obviously, we know crown is, obviously is talking about his authority. That he's going to be handed and that and he's making a covenant. He's going out conquering and conquering. So that's that's one of the reasons that we we know that the Antichrist He's going to, you know, in the, in the middle part of it, that's where he breaks his covenant with the people and actually starts to destroy things. And then we look at Revelation 6, 4. He says, uh, peace was, uh, what does it say? Peace removed. Violence breaks out with a sword. Well, that makes you wonder if that's not going on now. <laughs> a lot of these things you may, I know it's not, but I'll tell you what, uh, there's a lot of similarities to what uh, what we're seeing today. You could see if that's not the case, which I know these things are not going to happen until uh, we're raptured out of here because we have to be in heaven at that time because the 24 elders is going to be in heaven. The 24 elders is part of the church uh, at that time because it says they were washed, they had their robes washed white uh, with the blood of the Lamb. They're singing the new song of the redeemed. They're in heaven at that time. We're in heaven at that time because the candlesticks uh, it's, it's burning around the throne of God. It's showing us as the beginning part of that. And that whole thing is whenever that is when Jesus opens the seals. So those, there's incremental steps that has to take place, which is one of my reasonings for the fact is I still am a pre-trib person for rapture. Uh, there's too many things that's showing that lines up that says we are going to be raptured out of this and that we will be in a totally different uh, dimension, place, at that particular time during some of these events to take place. So the seals are opened after, the, it's, it's like John saying that he was in heaven and he was worried about there was nobody that was worthy to open the seals at that particular time. And they said, Jesus is the one, the line of the tribe of Judah, the lamb that was slain, he's going to open the seals. We're all going to witness up in there the things that's going to happen at that point in time. We're seeing these events take place on that side of what's taking place because we are around the throne and those things. So you, you, can, you can have confidence that we're going to be raptured out. Amen? Now, because I told you I will give you different concepts of the rapture, I'm, 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 I'm doing a parenthetical insert into this now. One of, the, one of the teachers that I've followed in the past has actually uh, talked about the rapture in this way uh, because he, he related it to the, uh, the harvest times of Israel. And so we know that there's, uh, there was times at Israel that the people were supposed to be gathered together during the harvest times. There had so many different dates throughout the year that the men were required to meet uh, in Jerusalem around the temple and to be gathered together. Now, here's, here's the, the concept with this. Um, one of the things that we know that there is a barley harvest that is first. The barley harvest actually has the, um, it's the most delicate. It's where you take the, uh, you know, you, you're throwing it up into the air and the, the stuff that's the shaft or whatever is blown out of the way and the seed comes back down. And it's symbolic of that's the very first, the very first season is the barley harvest where they're throwing it up in the air. Like that, so it's real. It's real delicate. They're taking care of it that way. The next one was the wheat harvest, and it's uh, obviously around the time of the uh, Pentecostal time, the you know the day of Pentecost, whatever else. But wheat, we know to get to the seed of the wheat, you actually have to crush the hull to get to the seed. So there's a crushing that takes place at that point in time. Then the last one, well, there's two more. There's actually another one. Uh, then you actually have the grape harvest. And obviously to get the fruit of the grapes, you know what has to happen there. It's totally, it's totally crushed. And then lastly, if, there's, if that's not enough, lastly it says in Revelations, I think, 14, it says there was four angels that sent out to the four corners of the earth to look into all of the world to find out if there's anybody left that does not have the seal of God on their foreheads that has not taken the mark of the beast and they are putting the seal onto their foreheads and that was symbolic of what happened with uh, Ruth uh, during the time with Boaz where it says that Boaz told them not to gather the, they were commanded not to gather the, the four corners to leave it for the sojourners and whatever else for the fields, you know, anybody that was hungry and whatever else that they would do that.
but there was a gathering together. So those angels are sent out at the very, very last to gather the harvest. Now here, here's, the, here's the premise of that teaching. The ones that are, are looking for Christ that are sealed are going to go up in the first one. There's people that maybe, I, and I, I don't want to place judgment on anybody. I'm not saying that they're worldly. I'm not saying that. There may be people that, that God is going to bring to him, but they didn't make it in the first load. So there's a, the wheat second one. There's going to be a lot of what I call gatherings that take place during the tribulation period because it, it, throughout that seven years, you end up seeing multiples of people gathered around the throne that just show up. Now, whether they were killed, martyred, whatever else, whether it was a net, another gathering, gathering like the 144,000 that's going to come, it says there's a multitude of people that's gathered with them at the same time. So if that's the case, then there's going to be another gathering at that time. That's why I don't want to call it a rapture. Nevertheless, there's a gathering that takes place during the tribulation period where the people, let's say they had to have their rough exterior crushed off of them to be able to be ready somehow. I don't know. Uh, then there's going to be a, a, a group of people that actually, uh, maybe they, you know, they were so tough or whatever else. I don't know. They, but they go through the tribulation period. They're actually going to be martyred. They're just going to be killed. And that's the grape harvest. It's showing the grape harvest, uh, you know, at that time. So that is a teaching that is out there that actually says some of those things that you can see throughout the tribulation period, because there will be people that are saved during the tribulation period. Amen? Yeah. Uh, everybody knows that there's going to be people. Matter of fact, there's probably going to be what they think is more people that's going to be saved during the tribulation period than even is on the earth as far as Christians right now. Amen? Amen. So those are some of the things. Now, now, all we are supposed to do, we are commanded to have our hearts ready and to look up and have great expectation for our deliverer. Amen? We're not supposed to be caught up in the world, worldly system. We're not supposed to be a part of that. We're supposed to be watching and waiting for the Messiah for us. Now, uh, personally, I think um, uh, because salvation is so incredible that it's, it's um, uh, and, and I'm, I'm even see, I'm belaboring the point here, but I'm, I'm even seeing more so now than I've ever understood about salvation the fact is that you have to be born again to make it into the kingdom of God. Amen. That's a simple statement. And let me see if I can explain it this way. If, if you, um, let, let's, let's put it in terms that we can understand. If you want to be saved, you have to receive the homing device. Because you're not going to go if the homing device is not there. Because once they sweep over everything, if you don't have the homing device on the inside of you, you ain't going. That's one way of looking at it. The point is, for us to be changed, that's why I think Paul said there's no flesh and blood is going to inherit the kingdom of God. We can't expect to be in heaven unless we have this interior of us born again. And it, 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 sound, it sounds cliche, but the point, the point is, uh, you can't, this realm that we're seeing other things come out of that is real, that whether you want to call it the fourth dimension, whether you want to call it the heaven above us, whether you want to, whatever it is, for that, for you to exist in that dimension, you can't get there unless you have been changed. That's kind of what I'm trying to say. Because this is not going to happen. You can't just go because you want to go. You actually have to be born again to go into that realm. For you to get into that realm and operate in that realm, you have to be able to be transformed. And the way you're going to be transformed is that Christ is going to change you in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, that you will be changed. And that part of it is where you're gonna, your, your body is going to change. On the... Now, I'm not going to go down that direction. This, th there's another area that's going to be for a future thing I'm going to talk about on the bad side of stuff. Homing devices get places, gets placed in people that changes their DNA. Uh, we'll go into that later. Amen. So those are some of the things that's going to be taking place. 
uh, the balance of scales, inflation, obviously we know there's going to be judgments that's going to be poured out at that time. Just the rapture is going to cause an economic crisis in the world. You can't imagine uh, with the, the most of the people gone and then all at once all these things taking place, how they're going to deal with stuff. So it's just, it's incredible what's going to, what's going to happen at that particular time. In Matthew 24, though, uh, the key event says, uh, uh, Jesus said, uh, um, let him who witches, it's Matthew 24, 17 through 20, says, let him who witches on the housetop not to come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days, but pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Jesus is actually talking to them from a Jewish perspective because there's, it's, it's a double uh, a double prophecy that happens because in reality he's also warning them about what's getting ready to take place in 70 AD because he's, there's going to be armies that are going to be compassed around Israel and Jerusalem that's going to take over and actually do the prophetic thing that says there's no stone upon this. It's not going to be torn down. It's going to be uh, torn down and demolished. And when you see these things happen, you're supposed to not even come down off your housetop, which is where in, if you've been in Israel... You understand your housetop is where you'd go up to, and it's kind of like your courtyard or whatever else. But it's saying that even, though, even whatever you're doing at that time, don't even take the time to get out and grab something. It says you just got to run. You got to run and get out of there, and that God's going to take care of you. And that's one of the things that God uh, talked to them. But whenever they asked, when are these things going to take place? And he told them, in the, not only for this time, but what's going to take place in the future, because in reality, we understand this has a future context to it also, that whenever the, the, the Jews in Israel at that time, they're going to be having to deal with fleeing for their lives. We understand that in the tribulation period, uh, because the Antichrist is so mad at the, at the, at the people of God and at, uh, uh, at, or the dragon or whatever you want to call him, they're so mad at the Jews and at the people of God, it says this, this point in time, these seven years, are going to be like no other time in history on the earth. Nothing. And I, I mean, we know we can read historically and look at all the things with the flood and everything that happened, you know, and all the stuff that's taken place, Sodom and Gomorrah and different places, you know, that's happened in, in wars and, and even in recent history with what happened with Hitler, uh, you know, and killing the Jews. And there was one in three Jews that was killed during the Holocaust in World War II. And during this time, they, they claim that it's possibly going to be two and three. So you can imagine how many people are going to be destroyed during this particular time in history. And that's just the part of what's going, that God is allowing these things to happen because he has a purpose to bring about Israel to crack that hard shell or, or a thing that's around them to get them to actually finally believe that he was the Messiah and that that's what's going on. And so those things are taking place for the purpose of actually getting to the place to where they're going to turn around and say, you know what, we do need the Messiah. He was the Messiah, you know, and those things. And that's, that's one of the things that I, I believe that uh, uh, is going to be happening during that time. Amen? And so we, we know that this, this time, this generation that sees these things come and pass, it says that generation will not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Uh, you know, and that, that scripture is actually not talking about uh, Israel becoming a nation in that generation. That's what, usually what we try to do with prof prophetic timeline. They say whenever we see Israel becoming a nation, we look at it as that generation. That's not the issue. It's this generation that sees these things happen, that, it's, that that's what's going to take place, that that generation will not pass till all these things be fulfilled. That's what's going to go on. Amen. And uh, we have... It's 5 till 12. Can I have like another 55 minutes? <laughs> 10 minutes? I don't know. Hey, hey, all right. Hey, I'm, I'm practicing social distancing, uh, social distancing. I'm staying away from the government. I don't know about you, but that's uh, uh, anything that they come out with, I'm going to social distance from that so much. I tell you, yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, you, if you, if you do have to go, don't please... Uh, don't do it. All right. All right. <laughs> Amen. Uh, it says here, I, I, I'll, I'll be conscious of our time. I'll, I'll make sure, I'll go a little bit longer, but I'll make sure you guys are out before the Baptists. 
says, For then shall be great tribulation, not since was the beginning of the world to this time, no will ever shall ever be. Uh, it's Matthew chapter 24, verses 21, 22. Except those days had been shortened, there should be no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. I want that to sink in. This particular seven-year period is going to be so horrendous and so catastrophic that the world has never, ever seen this, ever. And it's going to be such an incredible time uh, that these things are going to be taking place. And Daniel actually got a chance to see it when he was praying, you know, and, and he was doing his 21 days of prayer, uh, you know, and actually the prince, uh, Gabriel, came to him to give him the answer of what was going on, told him, you know, I would have been here sooner. However, the prince of Persia stopped me from coming, you know, and so uh, these, that's one of the things I want you to uh, as a side note to understand too, when we talk about, I talk about principalities and powers and rulers of darkness over territories. That's one of the things that confirmed that that prince of Persia was over that territory and actually was stopping the things of God to try to take place. But they, they broke through. Actually, Gabriel had to send forth for Michael, the warrior, to come and help him so he could get through and, and give the answered prayer to what was going on with Daniel. But they gave him some of the things that was going to be going on in these last days and told him about it. And obviously, there's things that was sealed up until the end also at that particular time that there was allowed to see, that Daniel was to see. But these, uh, it gets in, and we, I know we're not going to be able to get into that with the amount of time today, but it talks about the 69 weeks and the 70 weeks and somewhat, and I'll give you just a little bit of a taste. We'll go into more detail later. Uh, but it was talking about that there was this this, uh, this week was talking about the week, meaning the seven years of tribulation that was that was taking place, and that was what uh, Daniel was uh, was given. There was uh, seventy uh, actual uh, weeks that was prophesied about, and it had to do with the uh, you know the Sabbath and what Israel had owed to God because they wasn't keeping the Sabbaths, and God told them, "I say that's okay, but you're gonna you're gonna have to pay me back," and those seventy weeks was part of that. But within that, there was this, this intersperse of what's taken place as the church age. And then also the 69 week and the 70th week is talking about those things. And that 70th week is part of what's taken place here with this, this final uh, chapter in world history. Uh, it says in, uh, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 25, 11 and 12, it says, The whole land shall be desolate. And astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years, and it shall come to pass that when the seventy years are com accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon, that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans, and it will make a, per a perpetual desolation. So he's talking about the seventy years right there, and that there was going to be servitude of the nation. Uh, Jeremiah twenty nine ten says, Thus saith the Lord that that after 70 years has accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you as causing you to return to this place. Now, one of the things I kind of brought out a little bit last week about the title deed, we know that the seals, the actual seals, the seven seals that was on this, this document because it was written on the inside and the outside was a document that actually was proving that it was a title deed for land at that time, and that's what I was trying to bring out last week, that that title deed, that Jesus was opening those things for us to get back the land that is owed to, owed to, to us as, a, as the nations, as God has given it to us, as, as Jesus. And that time, it's like God says, okay, here's, the, here's this title deed, we're bringing it out, and Jesus was the only one that was worthy enough to open it up. But what happened here symbolically with Jeremiah is that Jeremiah was uh, prophetically was asked by God, even though he knew he was going to be in captivity and the nation was going into captivity, he was required by God to buy a purchase uh, piece of land and they would to seal the document that was taking place, put it in a sealed chamber, bury that into the ground. And it was, it was the people of that day, they knew, you know, Jeremiah was going to be alive whenever those 70 years was done. However, he was doing that as obedience to God because he was realizing there is going to come a time where all these things are going to be fulfilled again. And they would pull that out of the ground. They would see the sealed document for the purchase price of the land and prove once again that God had kept his word 
for the, uh, the judgment was going to take place for those 70 years and that, that Israel would be gathered back together again, allowed to come into the, uh, to the land. So that's one of the things that, that God had a person do that was symbolically of what is going to take place in the spirit realm whenever those things are happening. And that's, that's why I'm trying to say again, God asks us to do certain things because there's, he's partnering with us for fulfillment of what prophetic things are going to take place. That's why, I, that's why I belabor the point about us praying, the things that you're getting to do to pray, and how it's very, very important that your prayers are, are subject to even warfare that's going on uh, to prove what's taken place in the world, amen, and then for the future events. So it's not just words you're spitting out into the air. You're actually changing the dynamics of what's taking place between that realm and this realm. And the two are connecting together. And God has given us that authority to be able to do those things. Amen? So you have authority based on God because you have the, the homing device on the inside of you. Therefore, your, your person has a lot more clout than somebody just speaking off the cuff. Okay? Uh, so you have, you have the authority that is on the inside of you that is able to be part, partnering with that. Let's, let's go through, the, at least go through the slides and make sure... What else we got? Let's see up there. Give me another slide there, if you would. Uh, da, 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 that one, oh, I like that. And then it, uh, that's Jesus saying that, you know, the, the temple is going to, everything's going to be torn down except for uh, you won't see, uh, you know, these buildings. You know, they were enamored with, uh, the disciples was enamored with the temple, which I'm sure was just gorgeous at that time. But Jesus said, don't even worry about it because all this stuff's going to be destroyed anyway. <laughs> Uh, you know, so let's go to the let's go to the next one. I guess that was man. We went through that quick. Is it? No, no, no. Let's do another one. Yeah, there we go. And he shall confirm. Uh, that's in Daniel nine twenty seven. He shall confirm the covenant with the many for one week. In the midst of that week, he shall cause the sacrifice, the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation that is determined shall be poured upon the. The desolate. That's the prophetic thing that happened with Daniel talking about the middle of the seven year period that the Antichrist is going to turn against everybody and actually cause problems that's going to take place. He's going to reveal who he is uh, during that time. And there's a there's somewhat of a timeline of the 70 weeks uh, that's in there, but he's going to reveal who he is. Now, uh, the, the whole seven years is considered tribulation. Now, I, I tend to think uh, that the latter half is normally called Great Tribulation. And uh, uh, I know that m some people may, we may disagree with that, but I, I think the latter half is what's called the Great Tribulation because here's, here's, the, here's the thing that I, the reasoning behind that. Even though God is really the one that's in charge uh, during those times, he's allowing some activity to take place uh, during the first three and a half years, which is really the Antichrist and the things that's going on in the world. Uh, there's going to be the seven, uh, what is it, the seven seals is going to happen. Then we got the seven trumpets and the seven bowls is going to take place uh, during the seven-year period. However, once the, the, the issue that happens with the abomination of desolation in the middle, what's going to take place then is like it's the wrath, what I would call the wrath of God being poured out in the last three and a half years. And that wrath of God is what is going to be so unbelievable. It's, if, if it's not enough in the first three and a half years, which is still considered tribulation, but in the latter three and a half years is going to be where they're going to be running for their lives and burying themselves and wherever they can bury themselves and trying to get away from things. And, and uh, possibly they think that if, if there's some implant that people actually get that's going to change their DNA, that they won't be able to die. And that's one of the reasons that the, they talk about the uh, their DNA being almost turning back into like the Nephilim type thing again and they're where they want to die and they can't die and you know they're crying out to die and whatever else and some of those things and so that's why uh, there's actually been and I could show you has anybody ever heard of uh, I think his name is Marzuli is it Larry? Larry Mar no. What is his name? LA. 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 What's his was he from California or what? What's yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So L.A. Marzulli, uh, I, I had actually watched a uh, video recently of his where he had actually documented from a, from a uh, uh, doctor, surgeon, 
not a not a believer had nothing to do with the, with being a believer whatever else uh, uh you know but they was they had done this scanning over this person that had actually had an implant put on the inside of him it looks like what they would give us as a chip to be able to do things you know whatever else but this actual it was re emitting radio frequencies and also was actually had this this source this power source on the inside of it uh, who knows whether it would change the DNA, but nevertheless, it would actually it had a magnetic field uh, that was almost like a battery. It was just this little bitty thing. They couldn't believe how strong this thing was, and so they set it up. They scanned it. They did the the whole the whole bit. They did the you know the, whatever that is with the gel and the you know that stuff. And then they uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Women know that. Um, they did the sonogram. Then they did the what's the next one? Would be a little bit better. They put you in. MRI, they did the, so they did all that stuff. Let's just start with going through the alphabet. Uh, they did all that stuff. They seen this thing. They knew exactly where it was, right by the knee. And the, so they scheduled the day they was going to take this implant out that he claims, because he wasn't a Christian, he claims that he had been abducted and had this thing put on the inside of him and had been uh, abducted several times, whatever else. And so they was going to take this thing out. So the day came for them to actually do the surgery on this person's knee. They pulled out the stuff again to mark where it was at and whatever else, they couldn't find it. It was gone. And, and so they thought, what's going on? You know, this is, this is not right. What, something happened. God spoke to L.A. Marzulli, told him, you need to pray and take authority over the thing that's cloaking that device. And he says, you know, he's, he's like, I... He didn't care if they thought he was crazy or not. He said, guys, we need to, I, I, he says, I'm going to pray right now that whatever's cloaking this device, that it stop in the name of Jesus. And, you know, and he's, uh, so he prayed that within two minutes, the thing showed back up again in this person's uh, knee and they pulled it out and, and whatever else. But uh, when it talks about, let's go to the next slide if you would. When it talks about us as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And, it, it, you know, there's a reference to, well, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Well, it means in that context that thing was going on as normal. However, whenever we look at the days of Noah, obviously God destroyed the earth for a specific reason. He destroyed all the people that was on the earth for a specific reason. I personally believe it's because of the, the giants that was out, the watchers that had fallen, that was having relationships with women at that time, and they were producing what's called the earthborn people, the Nephilim, and they were uh, corrupting the DNA in the earth, and that's why God had to destroy it, because he said no, it was found righteous. It doesn't mean that he was sinless. It means that his DNA uh, was not corrupted, and that's why they were... God was saving these eight people to, get to start over again, but the rest of the people, animals and everything else, DNA was being corrupted by the, these creatures, the Nephilim and whatever else, the angels, the half angels, half man, uh, you know, the fallen, the watchers and whatever else was going on during that time. And so there was a lot of things that was happening pre-flood world that God says, as it, Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Now, they're experimenting with all kinds of stuff that, that uh, let's, put, let's put it on the logical side. If I came up with some kind of vaccine or some kind of implant that I could put on, put on the inside of you and it would take care of every virus, everything, every, and you would no longer, you'd live for another 100 years, and we would say, hey, we got this thing, we've, we've found the fountain of youth now, we're going to place it on the inside of you. People would be lining up and say, okay, yay, I, got, I could do this. But it changes your DNA. They're, they're experimenting with all kinds of stuff right now that is, sounds like scientific uh, mumbo-jumbo, but it's not. I mean, like science fiction, but it's not. And they're messing with DNA that, with the CRISPRs. And I mean, you could just, there's a whole, whole you know, uh, bantering back and forth whether they should mess with people in the first place, whether they should actually do that or not, but they're doing it anyway. Whether we like it or not, they're messing with the DNA and trying to create the ultimate human or the ultimate fighter or the ultimate uh, soldier, whatever it is. You know, they want to uh, 
And then if that's not enough, then what if there are things on the earth during this time now that are actually part of the seed of Satan that are living amongst us that has the wrong kind of homing device on the inside of them? I mean, we we could go, that's why I gave you these sheets because there's a lot of paths we can go down. If you guys want to learn about some stuff, believe me, there's... uh, uh, Carla, I, I usually write all the negative stuff. And Carla said, well, you better put some positive stuff on there, too, if you want to study about that. So one side is Carla's side. The other side is the really weird stuff that I like studying just for honoring us. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, just about, I'm just about done. Uh, let me see. if there is there one more slide? I think that's probably the last one, at least for today. Anyway. Uh, we didn't get it into all of this, but I am gonna I am gonna quit at this point right now. We will continue with this next week.